All righty. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, we're going to be talking about China and Japan for the world of wine. So wine is actually made all over Asia. It's not just China and Japan. We're going to cover these two countries briefly tonight uh, because they're up and coming. A lot of people do sincerely believe that China will actually rival, if not overcome, uh, Napa wine within the next 50 years. Some people believe even less. Some people believe that'll never happen, but it really comes down to your personal opinion and what your preferences are, of course. Um, but yeah, like I said, wine is made in a lot of other countries in, in Asia as well. So India, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Korea, Kazakhstan, um, all of the above and more. So lots to learn out there. Um, but today, of course, we're focusing on China and Japan. So China, of course, the quality of wine has increased significantly. Um, just within the past 10 years, Chinese wines have received really, really legitimate high-end awards from Decanter World Wine Competition and others. Um, their wines for the Chinese market is typically either mass-produced, so very, very affordable, $3 a bottle, um, so anyone in China can afford it, or it is the very opposite tip of the scale where it's newer estates that are targeted towards very affluent Chinese consumers. So two very, very, very harsh extremes there for their industry. So China um, and a lot of other countries in Asia face a lot of very, very extreme, extreme weather conditions. Um, viticulture in China really has to work very hard to protect against these freezing elements. So in a lot of the existing wine regions, particularly the northern ones, vines must be weather protected to prevent extreme freeze damage. So it can get up to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit there. So in order to protect the vines from this type of frost damage, they're actually buried underground. So this is called deep ditch cultivation. It typically um, is, uh, the ditches are dug out three to five feet deep, and then the vines are actually buried every winter. So every winter it looks like the vineyards are empty, but the vines are actually sitting below this mound of dirt that you can kind of see here in the corner. Also, in addition to that, uh, because of the climate, uh, a lot of regions are trying to research into hybridized grapes. So Vitus vinifera, the European grapes that we all use and love, and um, Vitus amarensis, uh, which is a local native variety, to help create cold climate resistance. So something that might help. But it's definitely something that's uh, very different than what we see in a lot of vineyards, especially in California. So another thing to add is uh, different regions of the world um, describe wine differently. So depending on the food of your culture or what is available in your country, um, something that might be meaty to the American palate or taste maybe like beef jerky um, might taste be described as like soy sauce in a lot of Asian countries, uh, even though we might use that as a descriptor as well. Um, some of the Western descriptors that we have, like blackberry and raspberry, are not flavors commonly found in Asian countries. So um, oftentimes you see like a lot of exotic things that even we might not know. So like lychee, uh, dengue, which is a traditional Chinese herb, fermented cabbage, and then uh, chui, chui chow stock, uh, which is an aromatic soy-based stock used for poaching meats. So again, it all comes back down to your culture and uh, what you've been exposed to, what you're familiar with. So, um, you know, something different to think about. So when you're shopping for wine and maybe you run into wine from China at some point, if you see descriptors that may seem unusual to you, um, don't be afraid to try it out. So something to think about. Okay, as it turns out, China has a very, very passionate love for French and Australian wine. For a very long time, uh, Chinese imports for wine were mostly French and Australian. There has been a recent hostility between Australia and um, Chinese wine organizations and government, and a 200% tariff was placed on Australian wine, and now there's a huge decline in imports. Uh, basically, the Chinese government was accusing Australia for 
underselling their wines to flood the Chinese market, and it directly competed with their wines, so they weren't happy. So, um, yeah, I don't quite completely understand it. It seems more like a political move, but anyways, this is an lecture about politics. So, anyways, because of that, uh, Chinese wine industry has been able to take off and to uh, flourish, but China still does adore French wines. Uh, wine auctions that include China's billionaires spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on several cases of French wine at a time. So it's very, very common. Uh, a lot of Chinese wineries actually call themselves chateaus and even create architecture to make it look like classic French winery chateaus. So that's how much they love it. They just love it that much. Um, China has actually created deals with French winemakers and Australian winemakers as well to be consultants at their Chinese wineries, even split ownership of the wineries up with large French wine companies. So um, it's actually kind of odd, but it does make sense. There are companies in China like Shandong and other companies um, that we'd recognize as French, but um, yeah, <laughs> that exists there today. So it's just kind of funny. As far as uh, wine varieties go for China, further reds, we see uh, lots of French varieties, so Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Syrah, and then we also have a Cabernet uh, Garnished, uh, which is, a lot of people say it's identical to uh, Carmenere. Then we also have Chardonnay, Semillon, and Chenin Blanc for whites. Then we have some interesting ones. We have some cold climate varieties, Riccatzatelli and Saparavi. I think those are actually... Uh, native to Georgia, if I'm correct. I'm about to fact check that. And then they also have a lot of other table grapes and other fruits that they make into wine. So uh, Muscat Hamburg, um, Neunai, which is also called Cow's Nipples. There's Kyoho, Thompson Seedless, Lychee, and Longan Fruit, which is also known as Dragon Eyes. So if you're actually interested in Kyoho grapes or um, Longan Fruit, you can go to 99 Ranch. Or I think, uh, which is in Folsom, and there's others too. And then there's uh, KP Market in Rancho Cordova. And they actually sell the Kyoho grapes, the Longan fruit, and even some of like really, really, really fancy Muscat grapes all the way from uh, China. They import it. And you can actually try those varieties. It's, it's actually very cool. I didn't know, but I was there last weekend, so I saw that, so. I'll have to try it. And the Kyoho table grapes are like seriously as big as your eyeballs. So those are fun. I'm sure they're good. I haven't got to try them yet. Okay, so for Chinese wine regions, the one that really stands out that is competing with Napa potentially is called Ningxia. It's an autonomous region within China. It's considered the Napa of China for winemaking. It borders the Gobi Desert of northern China. So it's one of the colder regions. Um, this region specifically is being funded by the government to help bring locals out of poverty. So the wine industry is really seen as a tool to help local economy, it gives people jobs, um, it helps produce money, the wine can be sold um, all over, you know, and it kind of stimulates itself. Then uh, we also have the Gansu province. This one is an area of uh, concern. It has uh, potential for ecological collapse due to vineyard expansion. So um, just improper practices um, can lead to desertification uh, because of because they are deforesting areas to put in vineyards. So the the edge of the Gobi Desert, there's um, you know there's trees in kind of like a mountainous area, and they're cutting it down to make vineyards, but it's it's eroding the soil and the desert's just kind of expanding and taking over. So anyways, it's a huge concern for a lot of environmentalists. And there's a huge debate over whether or not establishing vineyards and wineries for economic help is actually good for the local ecology. So something to think about. Um, I do have a video link for this that I can put in the description. Um, it is in the module for my students. So I yeah, definitely have to check that out. Um, then we have uh, Xinjiang, which is a region that sees a lot of French and um, Uyghur 
I am sorry, sorry, I don't pronounce that wine influence. And then we have Shaanxi as well. So some of the top regions. But uh, Ningxia is definitely uh, the one with all the top right now. Okay, moving on to Japan. Um, Japan is also a very interesting and very different Asian country for winemaking. It's definitely new on the map as well. I think it's really exciting to see all these different countries take on winemaking and see their, their take on it. So Japan has actually grown table grapes for a very long time. Production of wine grapes didn't begin till the second half of the 19th century. There are a few independent wine producers in Japan. Uh, most of them are large beverage conglomerates, such as Suntory, uh, Mann's Wine Brands, Sapporo, and uh, Mercian Corporation. So again, just like two very, very large extremes of a couple of single owned producers and then just like mass companies. So Suntory is actually, um, might be familiar to some of you guys, it's actually a huge conglomerate for beverages and food. And they distribute and own all of these brands that you see in the photo and probably more. So Maker's Mark is a Japanese owned company, uh, owns that brand. Then we have like Hornitos, um, these little uh, uh, all ready to go mixed drinks you can find at Target. I forget what this brand is called, this bottle here and some others you might recognize. Um, but yeah, it's just really interesting because everything's related. So very, very cool. So for all the conglomerates in the area, they all have access to locally grown grapes. Three quarters of the wine is bottled. Sorry, three quarters of the wine that is bottled is imported as bulk wine or concentrate from other countries. So uh, still kind of new to this market and still relying a lot on imported um, goods and to produce this product. So wines that are made with 100% domestic grapes, though, if you can buy them, are very, very expensive and they're hardly ever exported. So it becomes very, very difficult to try these wines for us. So for the wine regions of Japan, we have the Yamanashi Perfe Prefecture, which is uh, Koshu Valley. It is the main production of Japan, so 31%. Um, we, there are a couple of small recognized wineries from there I have listed. Next, we have uh, Nagano, which is 23% of production, contains four wine regions, also known as Shinshu Wine Valley. Then we have Hokkaido, which is 17%. This is the northernmost region up here at the very, very top. Um, this is another situation where the wine industry was set up to help the economy, um, created the one village, one specialty movement, and it became very successful. Then we have Yamagata, which um, is up here, kind of um, northern-ish center of Japan here. This interest, this region is really interesting. Um, wine was actually originally produced in this region um, in World War II, the grapes were grown, the wine was produced, um, to provide soldiers with cream of tartar as a dietary supplement. And, um, interestingly enough, the food that the soldiers were being rationed during the war led them to be very, very constipated. So cream of tartar is a natural laxative. So, um, yes, <laughs> something kind of a little fun fact for you. And then last but not least, we have Miyazaki Prefecture which is um, the southern island of Kyushu. So very, very cool. I really hope at some point we can get some of these wines imported to the United States so we can uh, try these wines. Um, okay, so varieties grown in Japan. A very, very big one that you'll see is Koshu. Uh, Koshu wine comes from the Koshu Valley and the Yamanashi Prefecture. Strictly speaking, there are no native grapevines to Japan. But Koshu is a white wine grape hybrid. It's evolved over many centuries in Japan. It's known to be light, floral, and a fruity white wine. Next, we have Muscat Bailey. This is a red wine grape hybrid of black Muscat and Bailey. Produces very grape juice flavored wine. So if you like Welch's, this will probably be the wine for you. Koshu, on the other hand, it's a very beautiful looking grape. It looks delicious. 
Um, it looks very, very tasty. You might be able to buy this one at the Asian market too. You have to double check. But uh, oftentimes, it's not included in, the, in this slideshow, but it is included on my module. Uh, wines, grapevines in Japan are have really, really high trellising systems and um, kind of like sometimes they're angled. Um, and this is to help with like typhoons and also to keep it aerated so it doesn't get a lot of mold. Uh, but not, but very, very often you will see also wax paper, little like hats uh, stapled onto the top of the cluster in kind of like a TP shape, a tapering method. And that's to help protect them from the rain. So the rain will, the rain will get in between the berries and produce mold in between the berries. So giving it a little rain cap is highly effective, but uh, very expensive for vineyard maintenance at protecting the grapes. So a lot of lot, a lot, a lot of work done to have vineyards in these countries. That's for sure. It's a lot of respect. But as far as I know, I, I don't think that Japan buries their vines. I think that just the humidity and the rain and the typhoons is the large um, problem there, as far as I know. Okay, so yeah, here is the viticulture practice. I was talking with the uh, vines being grown at an elevated height. It's, again, good ventilation to combat the high humidity summers. So this is, this is pretty significant. I mean, we're not just talking about, like, shoulder height for me. I'm only 5 foot 4. But we're talking about about 5 feet to, um, you know, 6.5 feet tall. So that's, that's pretty amazing. That's basically, for someone my height, that's almost that's like a canopy you could walk under and have a lunch under. So those are pretty pretty high up. So definitely picking is done, looking up and um, picking the clusters from there instead of bending over. So again, we also have horizontal trellises. So you can see these are kind of at an angle here. And this is used to combat wind damage from the typhoons. So everything helps. And then I have some review questions. So that's about all that I have for China and Japan. I do know that it's, it's very brief. I apologize for that. Um, it's, there's not an extreme amount of information on these regions or wines that we can try from them um, here in the United States. But I do highly recommend looking into the wine Bible and reading into um, kind of cheap. Uh, Karen McNeil mentioned some like specific wineries and um, some more information there. So you can check that out. Alrighty. Well, that is everything I have tonight. Hope you guys learned something new. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you guys next time.